During Python 3.13's development, there has been a lot of talk about the new just-in-time compiler, which was introduced a few months ago at time of recording. However, Python has technically had a just-in-time compiler for some time, and I'm not talking about PyPy, I'm talking about Number. Number is a third-party package that works, as the name suggests, primarily for numerical computations, but it does allow you to compile functions just in time using a decorator. Meaning that in situations where it's best suited, you can actually get anything up to about a 25 to 30 times speed up in a function just by adding a decorator. Now, as amazing as it is, it's not quite a magic wand for everything. I'll be going over uh, you know, some of the use cases as well as some of the, the, uh, the negatives of it in this video. But before that, let me talk to you about password security and Keeper Password Manager. I've been using Keeper Password Manager for about 18 months now, and I can honestly tell you that I've used it every day. It provides an encrypted vault where you can not only store your passwords, but also your files, your backup codes, your payment information, the lot. On top of that, it comes with a configurable password generator, so you don't even have to think about the passwords themselves. Keeper also operates under a zero knowledge policy, meaning everything is encrypted and decrypted at the device level. All of this means that your passwords are as secure as they can be. I opted for Keeper over the competition because of just how many industry awards it's won over the years. And honestly, they're not wrong. To upgrade your password security with Keeper today, use the link in the description below for 30% off your first year. But all that the way, let's answer the question, can you really speed up your code using just a decorator. To get started with number, we first need to install it. So we can do pip install number like that. And we install version 0.60. It does also install version two if you don't have number already installed. So it does support version two, uh, which is important to know. And we're gonna open up this Monte Carlo uh, thing here, because this is actually a really good example of how number can help speed things up. So for those that aren't familiar with the Monte Carlo simulation, you could do some research. I'll leave some links in the description. But in short, it is essentially a method of estimating uh, a value by using random variants. So you can see we have the randoms here. And the Monte Carlo pi problem aims to estimate the value of pi using this simulation. And the idea is that you have a theoretical square and a theoretical circle and you can plot points randomly within the bounds of the square, and you can use the number of values that land in the circle to determine the value of pi. Now, I'll leave again, I'll leave some other links. I don't want to spend too long uh, talking about that because that's not what the video is about. But this is a particularly good um, problem for us to demonstrate the speed of number. So we have a little bit of a benchmark down here. We'll do some proper benchmarks in a bit but we get the value of pi using 100 million samples, so we'll plot 100 million points. We're gonna grab the speed uh, and we're gonna print it and as well as the value. So if we just run pi monticolor.py, and it occurs to me now this does take a little while, so I probably should have been running this while explaining what everything does, but it's running through here, it's generating all these random numbers, plotting all these points, and finally it will do this um, numerical calculation at the end. To get the value of pi, which is pretty close, it does get really close actually with 100 million samples. As you can see, that calculation is still on oh, this. I need to get rid of that line. Ignore this top line, but we see that pi is a relatively decent number in 14,808 milliseconds. So it took about 14.8 seconds to run in pure Python. In number, what we can do is we can either import, whoops, uh, JIT or NJIT, and then we can use them as decorators. So I'm going to explain the JIT one first. So you decorate a function with this JIT decorator, and essentially what happens is that number will go and compile the function just in time, hence where JIT comes from, and then use this just in time compiled version when running it. And the idea is that it would be a lot faster. The NJIT is the same sort of thing. You just pass, oops, I've clicked something by accident. You just pass no Python equals true. And now you have the NJIT. So we can replace that with this and it will do exactly the same. It's just a convenience function. If you were to run the NJIT on this, now we would see that it runs a lot faster. Uh, it's not quite as close. That might just be due to variance within the actual program. Let's run it again. See, okay, yeah, that one's a lot closer. See, it runs even faster. It ran in less than a second that time. 
around about 1.1 seconds before. So we can see that the compiled version of this Monte Carlo problem is significantly quicker. And all we needed to do was add a, a decorator. Before we move on, I will briefly explain a little bit more about the differences between JIT and NJIT. Uh, so the JIT can run in two modes. It can run in no Python mode and it can run in object mode. And object mode has access to the Python API. No Python mode obviously doesn't by the name. The no Python mode is faster if you can get it to compile, but there are instances where it won't be able to. So if it needs to get the, or if it needs access to the Python API uh, for whatever reason, for example, you're doing things that number perhaps isn't best suited for, the NJIT version will fail and the JIT version will need to be used in object mode. The JIT decorator will actually attempt to compile in no Python mode first, but it will then fall back to object mode uh, if it doesn't work. So of course I have some benchmarks for this. This is exactly the same function as it was before, but we are now uh, comparing the speed with uh, no decorator. And then we're using some fancy syntax to decorate the function with the JIT and with the NJIT respectively. The number is only one, so doing it like this doesn't matter. Uh, but we are repeating the code five times to get rid of any variance. And at the end, we simply just print a table which has the uh, the no decorator, the JIT and the NJIT versions, and then it prints how much relatively faster it is. That was a sentence that made sense. If we just run it, <laughs> That would probably be the easiest way. And I realized I probably should have been uh, been running this while talking as well. But it prints in a uh, in a fancy table like I did for the message spec video. Tabula, I really do want to make a video, or at least a short on Tabula at some point, because it is really nice for this sort of thing. Uh, but we are running it in milliseconds, and it is per run, because we're only running it once per cycle. So the time displayed is how long it took to do the operation once. Uh, so that's important to note. Okay, I was hoping to be able to chat my way through that, but uh, it took way longer than I, I thought it would, so I had to cut. But you can see the differences there. So without the decorator, again, it runs about 14.8 seconds. With the JIT and NJIT decorators, it run in about half a second. This is the fastest of the five that we're running. You can see that it's 20 or almost 29 times faster just by adding a decorator, which is absolutely insane. You can see that the JIT and NJIT, um, I'm pointing at the screen as though, because I always do that. <laughs> you can see that the JIT and NJIT times are, are roughly the same. And that's because, you know, as I was saying before, the JIT will use the no Python mode if it can. And in this case, it can, so it did. Uh, so you can see that they are pretty much the same speed. With that being said, number is not a magic wand, as I'm about to show. So we have this other file here called Euclidean, and this file here has a various uh, array of functions, all of which do exactly the same thing. Just one is jitted and one is ngitted. And they calculate the, uh, the 2D Euclidean distance between two points. So you have two points with an X and a Y coordinate. The points are defined up here, so we have 0, 0 and 3, 4. Spoilers, the Euclidean distance is five, so it should always get five. And we have just a little um, test ground down here to show you the potential disadvantages of having something that is JIT compiled. Mm -hmm. So if we do pi Euclidean, and this will run each thing just once, you can see that the pure Python version, which is at the top, took 2,584 milliseconds. Mm -hmm but the jitted version took 396 million. That is something in the region of about 154,000 times slower. And that's purely because it had to spend time compiling it. It's not compiled in advance, it's compiled at runtime. This is why it's called a just-in-time compiler. The NJIT version was significantly quicker because the function had already been compiled and we can actually prove that by swapping these two around. And if I were to put the NJIT one first, we would see that we get similar results. I presume there's some sort of shared memory that the jitted versions use, but it still needs to compile it and actually find all this shared memory. So it's significantly faster the second time around, but it's still an awful, awful lot slower than just doing it in pure Python. Of course, I have benchmarks for this too. So it runs on a, a, a similar system. Although this time, to make it fair, we're not compiling it each time. We have just the function that's just passed straight in. And we pass the points through and we 
you know, print the same table out. So if we do uh, benchmarks euclidean.py, we will see that the effect is nowhere near as great as it was because we are in the benchmark running it one million times. And of course, once you have something JIT compiled once, you don't need to compile it every time you run it. It will always be compiled. In this instance, the pure Python version is still quicker than the JITed version. Uh, the reason for that, I genuinely don't know. But uh, yeah, I'm presuming it's just because it's doing some tuple operations and maybe the JIT just isn't really able to optimize it that well. I do also have a second benchmark, which has uh, a NumPy implementation instead. So we use NumPy and square root and NumPy sum. And then we have a 2D array that we pass in. So we have this points here. That is a 2D array. We pass that through. If we were to run this benchmark, we will see that the results are quite a bit different. And you will see that not only are the JIT and NJIT versions faster, than the pure Python versions when it actually decides it wants to show it on screen. Again, I was hoping to blag my way through that. Uh, but you can see that the uh, the JIT versions are significantly quicker than the non-JITed versions in this case. Uh, and they are also faster than their pure Python alternatives, but they are slower than just the normal pure Python implementation. And this is what I mean when I say that number isn't a magic wand. It's really good for specific mathematical operations, especially complex ones. The more complicated, the more number is in its element. But for simple things and for less mathematically oriented things, it's not quite in its element. There is one more problem with number that I do want to show off. And for that, I have brought on screen a k-means plus plus implementation that I wrote a few years ago for a university assignment. Uh, and it's done in NumPy. Uh, you can see we have this distance calculation. I literally just proved that a pure Python version of this is faster, but we are using NumPy to do the rest of it. And as such, NJITing it is just a lot quicker, especially considering I believe this gets run a few million times or at least a few hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. We have a few other functions as here, uh, here as well that do some various things. And then we have the main k-means plus plus function, which does an awful lot. The exact specifics don't really matter um, for what we're doing here, but I want to prove that this works. So we will run it. And we'll see, we get this uh, nice little graph back showing the clustering and performance statistics. I forget exactly what this is showing. It's been a few years, uh, but this is essentially what it's doing. It takes a series of points and it clusters them. And these three red dots are centroids. That's all it really does. But the line I want to draw, well, actually first, you may wonder why I haven't NJITed this function. And if I do, and we'll just use mb.jit to give it the best chance, we will see that it actually errors. And if we look up, this it's a quite a complicated error, but the main thing is here. Uh, so rejected as the implementation received a specific error, typing error, uh, gone unexpected keyword argument P. I forget how much, how useful this actually is. I don't think it's amazingly useful at all, but the line it's complaining about is this line here, line number 44, this mp.random.choice samples range P. You saw it just worked. So MP does have, if I, I might be able to look at the, nope, oh, maybe. Not okay, never mind. But it, it does have this p available, and this p is essentially a series of probabilities. So it's weighted random choice, essentially, is what this is doing. But the problem is that number doesn't support that. And the reason why, if I were to go, if I go via here, and then if I go to here, and then if I go C Python random implementation, is the way that these things have been re implemented. So everything is re-implemented from scratch. So we have this overload mp.random.choice and you will see that p in version 0.60 at least is not here. We don't actually have p at all. And this is what is being run, not the mp.random.choice in its raw form. And the problem that this exposes is that you are slightly limited in what you can do with number by what has been implemented within the JIT compiler. So, you know, this P argument to mp.random.choice has not been implemented in the JIT compiler. And so even though NumPy has it available, you cannot use it. You just can't use it. I don't know of any other examples of this 
This is one I just happened to find completely by chance when I tried to use number to optimize this. Uh, there may be some others out there. It really depends on how comprehensive their coverage is of the NumPy API. Hopefully with the drastic simplification of the API that NumPy 2.0 provides, it will be a bit easier to get a bit of extra coverage, maybe even full coverage from numbers end. But for now, you are slightly limited in what you can do. But of the things you can do, number massively speeds them up. And it also has a few extra features as well to get back into the positives a little bit. So if I go over to the documentation page, you can see they have this Monte Carlo Pi uh, function on the front. We also have this other function that uses parallel equals true. So we can achieve auto parallelism using number, which is actually really nice for things that support it. So this log uh, logistic regression, for example, supports it. There is something else that looked quite interesting. If I go back into the source code and I go into number, so this is cfunc uh, decorator as well, which is used to compile a Python function into a C callback usable with foreign C libraries. And you can create uh, a function using C types and then just decorate it and it will compile it for you. I'm not going to demonstrate either of those last two things in this video because it's getting a little bit long already. And of course, there's got to be something for you to experiment with on your own. If you do experiment with those two things, do let me know how they work because I'd just be interested to know. Let me know in the comments how number is going to be of help to you. Or if you have used number before, let me know what sort of successes you've had with it. It'd be really interested to know how people are using it. If you're interested in finding out other ways that you can make Python faster, I have an entire playlist dedicated to it. It's called Python But Faster, and it will be in the end cards at the end of this video. But I'll see you in the next one for whatever we do next.